is saying climate event in a slightly different way, in a slightly more specific way. Uh, and that's going to be based completely off of, uh, of world wind web. One last question, or else we probably should move on, but unless something burns. Okay, good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we move to <coughs> session two. Hopefully that was relevant. This is the first time for me at OGC. <laughs> <laughs> we'll invite you back, man. Yeah, it's good. It's all good. So we have session two, <laughs> which is on the topic of um, <clears throat> obtaining big data. Uh, and we have two major sources, types of sources we're going to talk about, imagery and streaming data. So first we're going to address imagery. And Jeff Walters from NASA uh, gave us a presentation about imagery acquisition from a NASA perspective. So that should be here. Everybody's watching remotely if that came up on the uh, webinar. Should be easy to change, he said. <coughs> Should it change? Yeah, it, it, it work? Cool. Thank you, Jeff. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm, a, I'm Jeff Walter with NASA. Um, I used to be the, uh, the deputy program, deputy project manager, or one of the deputy project managers for uh, NASA's Earth Observing System Data <laughs> and Information System, where we, um, we manage uh, 12 data centers that, um, uh, where we archive, ingest, archive, and distribute um, all of NASA's remote sensing, Earth Observing uh, remote sensing data. So um, I'm no longer in that position. I, that posi that uh, office is at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, so my replacement, Mark McInerney, um, couldn't be here today. Um, so I'm now the science data service, lead science data services engineer at one of those data centers, uh, the Atmospheric Science Data Center at, uh, at NASA Langley. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that NASA is doing uh, to uh, evolve in kind of this, uh, this big data space. I mean, we're, you know, we have 12 data centers and the purpose, one of the, you know, so it's a complex uh, enterprise where, you know, we're responsible for managing all of this remote sensing data from the program, but we're also responsible for um, uh, organizing it and making it available and distributing it to the science community um, and, and others as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about what we do here. Uh, which way, George? It won't advance. Should be in there. Oh, because you're in the context of the <clears throat> Oh. So before I get into this a little bit too much, um, something that one of the uh, individuals in the back said a little bit earlier during our, during George's opening remarks that I kind of saw feel allow me to, to wax philosophic for just a minute. Um, I, I have to sort of uh, respectfully disagree with the point that somebody made a point about programming languages and nobody's going to care about uh, uh, APIs or any of that kind of stuff in the future because everybody will be able to code. Having spent you know the last 18 years in systems development, it's been my experience that. It's about two things. That, that system and software development is really about two things. It's all about data structures, for one thing, from a software point of view. And it's also about interfaces. So technology is always changing. There's always going to be a new programming, you know, slick new programming language or a new technology to help you solve some sort of problem. And those things are great. And those things can inform your overall architecture. But the, mo the important thing is to, is to um, architect your system so that those things can change underneath the hood 
where you don't, you know, and you don't have to necessarily change anything <laughs> that relies on what you're doing. So for example, you know, I can plug my device into that wall outlet, the same wall outlet I've been able to use for the last God knows how many years, but the power plant down the street can switch from coal to gas to solar and I don't care. So when we take, so this is kind of the philosophy or the point of view we're trying to take with um, with the whole Earth Observation uh, Enterprise. So um, the Earth Observation Data System Enterprise. So just a little bit more about the program here. Um, it's, we're a multi-petabyte archive um, that supports earth science research and applications. Uh, at the moment, you know, in the old days when this program started in the mid '90s, you know, we were we were sort of like the original gangsters of big data, or at least we thought we were. But now it's like the amount of data that we have is, you know. Like George said, you could probably <laughs> fit in your backpack or at least one one or two racks, you know, in the wall. We have probably 12 to 15 petabytes um, of data across the entire program. But it's but it's so in our case, big data is less about volume today um, uh, than it is about uh, complexity uh, and variety. So um, that's going to change a little bit in the coming years. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we do ingest, processing, distribution, access, metadata management, uh, and data stewardship. And um, you know the collections, like I said, are extremely diverse. A lot of it's satellite remote sensing data. Some of it's airborne and in situ. Um, we have some data from international partners. Um, you know, and it has a wide variety of um, you know spectral, spatial, uh, and temporal resolution um, uh, and variability and footprints. So it's 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 very complex data. Uh, this is kind of an archaic graph we've been tossing up for, for many years. It just, just shows the locations of all of our distributed data centers. Uh, some of them are at NASA field centers like Langley. We actually have four at Goddard. Um, and then some are with uh, other agencies. We have the, the land processing stack uh, is actually at the USGS in Sioux Falls. And um, what's the other one? We ha and we do we have a data center at, uh, at Oak Ridge as well. And the rest are at, uh, at various universities, University of Colorado, University of Alaska, et cetera. Um, and again, this is just a, you know, not intended for you to digest, but this is just to show that we, our measurements and, and data, we've sort of run the gamut of earth science data, you know, ocean land processes, you know, all things atmosphere, cryosphere, um, you know, you name it, um, we have it with respect to the observational data. Um, so one of the challenges that we face with all this data is obviously, you know, interoperability. Like I said, the complexity, um, you know, it's, you have different disciplines which like to do things in their, in their different uh, sorts of ways. And then, of course, uh, like I said, the, the actual characteristics of the data um, is, is very, uh, you know, very wide. You know, so it's a multifaceted problem. So these, these workflows for the user to discover access and use the data, um, you know, interoperability touch, uh, questions touch each one of those things. So you know, we've been working in this space for a while, and we've made some, you know, some progress on improving. So you know, um, for many years, we've, um, we've uh, really promoted and required, in fact, from our data providers the use of standardized data and data metadata formats, um, particularly HDF. Most of our data is in HDF uh, 4 or 5. Um, uh, but we have some in others. We have that, some NetCDF, some GeoTIFF, uh, things of that nature. Um, but even in that, even within those confines, um, you know, those, those formats give you a lot of freedom to define your data structures and things like that and how you store the data. So it still presents a bit of a challenge. Um, we have a centralized, <coughs> excuse me, metadata repository. Um, so all the data centers maintain their own, you know, internal databases, but we have a central repository for them to send uh, everything. So you could do an <coughs> enterprise-wide search for anything that you're looking for, and this is based on a kind of a modular, a unified metadata model. Um, uh, internally uh, that allows us to, you know, with various components. Uh, it's very componentized, so you can uh, sort of um, add new things onto the model without having to change the entire schema all the time. Um, and then we can provide data, metadata back out to you in this sort of multiple standard formats, including ISO 19105. Um, we have a client for that, um, for that, uh, um, for that um, repository that we've developed, and then uh, we have a, an imagery browse services for services data through WMTS, so a user can kind of uh, visualize certain parameters or, or kind of explore visually at a very high level uh, just to see and find things they might potentially be interested in. Uh, but again, you know, we do have a lot of challenges uh, that remain, uh, which uh, some of them have already touched on. The, you know, the standardized and data formats don't get you all the way there for sure. Um, you know, the, uh, all the heterogeneity in the data, 
and we have discipline-oriented data centers that have evolved to serve specific communities, um, and, and, and these communities, uh, you know, they have their own particular requirements and their own ways of doing things, and sometimes they don't, uh, uh, they don't always interact well. So, you know, the original dream of the Earth Observing System program at NASA was um, interdisciplinary Earth science. It's like if we take all these concurrent measurements, you know, kind of at the same time, it enables people to cross their boundaries and uh, of their specific disciplines uh, to get a, a more of a holistic view of what's going on. And um, some of that happens, a lot of it happens, it's happening more and more, but it still remains, uh, uh, even you know, 20, 20 plus years on, it still remains a very significant uh, challenge uh, you know, to do. So you know, inertia is kind of a powerful thing. Um, you know, so one of the things that we're trying to do is, is, at least from the structural point of view, kind of overcome the barriers that prevent that. Now there's still obviously cultural <laughs> issues in the various communities, uh, but that's that's slowly uh, but surely changing. Um, so one of the ways, so how do we evolve uh, to meet these requirements for the future? Um, what we're gunning for here is not so much um, you know a monolith. You know, in the old days, I think that was the way. When this when the whole this whole enterprise started back in the 90s, the original dream was to make you know like George said, one sort of system to rule them all. Uh, there was a lot of backlash against that. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, oh, okay, right, right. sorry. Yes, you, I would yes, have been right. shot if I had said it. Right, right. No, but, so that was the idea. Of, there was a lot of backlash against that. So, so the pendulum swung uh, a lot, you know, kind of in the other direction where, you know, everybody was allowed to kind of go off and do their own thing in a quote unquote distributed way. Well, in my mind, distributed was just code for, I want to go do my own thing, leave me alone. Um, so now we're trying to swing the pendulum back a little bit to the middle where, you know, we still have, you know, all the, the individual communities can still maintain the things that they do well um, and, and the things that, you know, their strengths, but, but at the same time um, make them a little bit more uh, interoperable, make it more of a system of systems kind of, a, kind of concept, uh, which, is, which is what we're working towards. Um, you know, and, and we're kind of, th this diagram here is sort of a simplistic view of our, uh, our kind of evolutionary path, uh, where, you know, today we have data, you know, tomorrow we're trying to evolve more towards the service, uh, uh, the service um, uh, sort of notion, service architectures, you know, and eventually towards data, you know, as a service, you know, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, possibly partnerships with the commercial clouds. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, in the meantime, while we're thinking about all of this stuff at the program level, how do we how do we move the, the, the whole enterprise forward? Um, we received a, a mandate. I, I was involved with the uh, U.S. Group on Earth Observations, with the, which is and along with uh, Jeff uh, Jeff De La from NOAA. Um, um, it's a it's a White House Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy group. Um, that is um, tasked with looking across the federal government's portfolio of Earth's Earth observation capabilities and, and figuring out how to, you know, are we investing our money in this enterprise, you know, the right way? Um, and how do, we, how do we increase the return on investment of all this money we've spent on Earth observations across the entire federal government, not just NASA? Um, you know, one of, the, one of the areas of that, one of the subgroups of that was focused on looking at, uh, at data. And how do we how do we improve the accessibility, discoverability, accessibility, and usability of all this Earth observation data to people who aren't necessarily the expert power users, um, which is a big problem due to some of the you know uh, complexity and heterogeneity of it that I mentioned before. So so they started this thing called the Big Earth Data Initiative, and they provided a little bit of funding um, to NASA, NOAA, and USGS to you know. The, again, the primary goals were to improve, like I said, discoverability, accessibility, and usability. It was a big interoperability exercise. And they kind of left it up to us, the individual agencies, to sort of um, propose how we would do that to, uh, for them. And we've all kind of gone about it in a slightly different way. So um, at the time, I was the project manager for this um, for, uh, when Betty came along for NASA. And, um, and so I kind of uh, focused on uh, you know, kind of a strategy that, that looked at uh, you know, these four things that we wanted to focus on um, creating the you know, enabling pieces rather than developing end user applications. So in other words, or data products. So in other words, how do we, how do we create uh, sort of uh, infrastructural capabilities that do a better job of doing that, that allow others to hook in 
you know, the, you know, to allow other people to build their own applications and do things with the data that we can't, we don't necessarily have to imagine or to think about. Um, and the way to get there is to drive things towards these sort of open community driven um, standards um, for formats, interfaces, and protocols. Like that's the key to interoperability. That's the common space. You know, if we can all sort of rally, you know, I think of it as sort of like a maypole or whatever, you know, we all kind of rally around these open standards and then the implementations of those things, you know, matter less as long as you adhere to the, to the standards. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to do things in a way, um, open source, where, where um, you know, the things that we do are easily shareable with other federal agencies and, and are useful to others as well. Um, so, uh, so our implementation sort of took this form. We focused on these three areas. One was uh, a catalog and data discovery improvements. So, um, you know, we, we funded some folks to come up with uh, metadata guidance and recommendations for, um, uh, for, uh, you know, for data providers who are to create metadata. Because this could be, a, if you don't know, as Ted, I'm sure will speak to you at length if you engage him about this. Metadata can be a complicated thing, and if, if you're new to the game people coming in just kind of get overwhelmed by it. So um, Ted and, and HDF group did a great job of um, coming up with some guidance for folks um, on, how to, on how to create uh, and submit metadata. Um, you know, DOIs, this is something we've been